My guest today is Michael Lumpkin. Michael has worn many hats in his extremely distinguished career, including Navy SEAL Captain, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflicts, Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Deputy Chief of Staff for the Department of Veteran Affairs, Special Assistant to the Secretary of Defense, and a Special Envoy at this Department of State. Michael's military career included numerous deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan, serving as the officer in charge of training the West Coast SEAL teams, team commanding officer, service as the deputy joint special operations task force commander for the Arabian Peninsula, and service at the U.S. SOCOM Office of Legislative Affairs. His civilian government career has included the implementation of the 2010 Omnibus Caregivers Act for VA, overseeing the Osama bin Laden operation, reorganizing the DOD POW MIA effort, leading the DOD's response to Ebola in West Africa, negotiating and executing the recovery of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, and direct appointment by the President of the United States to stand up the U.S. Department of State Global Engagement Center to counter ISIS marketing efforts. Michael is currently the Chief of Staff at U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement and a Commissioner on the Afghan War Commission. I really enjoyed this chat because Michael has a uniquely broad level of knowledge at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels of national power, including on both the military and civilian sides. This has given him a very unique perspective on leadership, selection, and standards. I hope you enjoy my chat with Michael Lumpkin. My name is John Becker. For the past four decades, I've dedicated my life to protecting tactical operators. During this time, I've worked with many of the world's top law enforcement and military units. As a result, I've had the privilege of working with the amazing leaders who take teams into the world's most dangerous situations. The goal of this podcast is to share their stories in hopes of making us all better leaders, better thinkers, and better people. Welcome to The Debrief. Michael, thanks for being here today. Thank you. So, so why don't we start? Let's go back to the to the beginning. Talk about the origin story. Uh, let's start with the Navy experience. When when did you first join the Navy? I joined the Navy in 1986, um, right out of college. So, graduated from University of California, San Diego, and went into the Navy. And what? Where did you start in the Navy? Yeah. So, I started off as a surface warfare officer. So, initially, I. You join the Navy as, as, as an officer. You go to officer candidate school. And then I came out to San Diego for um, learning how to drive a ship. And, of course, at the time in the 80s, the Navy's motto was, join the Navy, see the world. So I grew up in San Diego. So I literally joined the Navy and saw the other side of San Diego County. <laughs> That's the world. <laughs> That's the world. That was my world in the Navy to start out with, yeah. So how long, how long did you do that before you decided to, to transition to the teams? Yeah, so back in that era, they were only taking about 16, 17 officers a year um, into the SEAL team. So it was very tough to get there, and the large majority of them came from um, the Naval Academy. So because I went through, through a, a, a conventional school and not a service academy, I was very, very competitive in their very few slots. So I spent a year uh, as a surface warfare officer and then ultimately trans- transitioned over to SEAL training. Um, once I qualified as a, a surface warfare officer. And so, okay, so you start, you obviously go to BUDS. Yep. What BUDS class were you in? I was in 162. And and where where did you go? Was there anything about your BUDS experience that, that we should talk about? Anything? Yeah, I mean, it, but BUDS is an interesting place, and a lot of people think it's kind of the end state of being a SEAL. It's really, it's a screening process. It's, to, it's, to scre- it's screening more than it is training is to screen candidates to see if they have the aptitude to um, to actually be a, a Navy SEAL. So I started out with 106, I think was the number in class 162. Um, by the time of that 106, by the time we graduated, I think there was 18 of the original class members that started. So it's pretty high attrition rate. Um, and, and I think it's just you have to be both mentally and physically equipped and, you know, and have, you know, frankly, good DNA and stay healthy um, to, to make it through training. But it, it, I saw guys who were world-class tri- triathletes not make it through. And I saw, 
kids from you know square states in the middle of the country who really never spent any time in the ocean that weigh 105 pounds make it through no problem so i mean probably the first and foremost thing i learned was you know don't judge a book by a cover um that pe people people are capable of many things and you got to get to know the person before you know what they're really capable of yeah it's kind of a recurring theme i've heard from people that have gone through either either you know whether it's you know ranger selection green beret selection uh you know delta selection buds any of those units is you know you look at the class the first day and you're like oh no that guy's that guy's gonna make it and that guy's not and sometimes the guy that you're like oh that guy's gonna make it just falls apart he does and, and sometimes it's health sometimes it's you know stamina sometimes it's just mental drive or i mean it could be issues at home you know it could be you know many reasons but uh, yeah, don't 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 look at somebody and and judge what you think they can and can't do so what what where did you go when you get when you get out to qualify where do you go yeah, so once you finish the the basic buds training at that time, um, I went to Army Jump School down at Fort Benning, and then went to SEAL Team Four, which focus was on Central and South America at the time, and that's where the real training started. So we did a um, it was a training block that uh, um, was uh, um, basically SEAL qualification training was the first real training to be a SEAL, and not so much screening, um, but you. You actually learn small unit tactics uh, at a SEAL team. And, uh, and then I deployed to Latin America and spent about four or five years uh, in and out of uh, Central and South America. And that's when, what year is that? So essentially, you think you're taking 89 to um, probably 94. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the Tom Clancy era of South America, <laughs> clear and present danger, narco wars, kind of time frame. Yeah, it was, I mean, it truly was the uh, wild, wild west. And frankly, from a Navy SEAL perspective at the time, it was kind of the only show operationally that was, that was going on on scale. I mean, there were there was things going on, in, of course, in the Pacific and, and the Middle East, but not like it was in, in Latin America. It was the height of the drug wars. And, uh, and U.S. drug policy was quite a bit different than, the, than what it is today. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's literally... Uh, that was Tom Clancy's clear and present danger, right? That's right. you have U.S. soft forces deploying against the cartels in in South America. Yes. Yeah, so, so I spent time, you know, assigned to a uh, um, DEA unit in Colombia. I've spent, spent time in Peru, uh, El Salvador, um, Panama, of course, and just uh, throughout Latin America. And uh, it, was, it was a great experience. I learned... Um, how to operate, you know, as a SEAL unit, but also the the benefits of working in an interagency um, kind of organization and construct um, to get the end states, because there are limits to military power and what the military can do, and sometimes especially in dealing with, like, situations uh, in Colombia and such, the benefits of that law enforcement and, and what they bring to the table and how to work together was uh, a key key thing that I learned that during that period. Where do you go? So you're there four or five years. Where do you go from there? Yeah. So then I, I kind of bounced around through different uh, um, SEAL teams and then uh, went to graduate school. The Navy decided that I needed more education. Um, truly where I understood that there's a difference between e e education and training. Um, the Navy, they kind of lump them together frequently, but they are fundamentally different. Um, I, I had a, a Admiral Olson once said something to the effect of, uh, uh, if, if you have a 16-year-old a daughter, do you want her to get sex education or sex training? <laughs> it, it, and so so th th that, that kind of highlights in yeah. your mind, of well, you know, there, there's a difference between the two. <laughs> and I heard him say that, say that once, and I was like, okay, that, that, that one landed to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I have a 17-year-old daughter. That one, <laughs> that one landed hard. I'm gonna, <laughs> making, making side notes here for a minute. <laughs> and I'm going to need some time to recover. <laughs> So, so define for me what you see the difference, you know, how you saw the difference between the two. Yeah, I, I, th I see education is the theory of the case. It's the uh, understanding the bigger picture where, you know, in, in the military uh, world, it's where policy and operations meet and why decisions are made that affect um, what happens on the battlefield. It's, it's, it's largely strategic and operational in nature. Um, I, I see training, especially as a, 
as a special operator is, is what's happening and how are you and your team going to react to the events that are happening around you and how are you going to plan for contingencies? It starts at the basics of mastering the basics, uh, predicting uh, what could go wrong and take steps to mitigate it, and, and, and how to prepare for what's going to come next. Um, it, and, and, that, and that requires some forethought and preparation of what the battlefield for tomorrow is going to look like, not just today. What's interesting about that is that, you know, the way you just described it is the way that I've always envisioned the two. Training is the how, education is the why. And I, I think that one of the problems that we have kind of today in, in military and, and special tactics, law enforcement special tactics, is there's a great deal of emphasis on the how. We spend a lot of time training, you know, we're going to train operators how to do things. We're not spending time teaching them the why. And so many of the kind of modern debacles that we see happening is because with the why comes the why not. <laughs> yes. And, and it just, it seems to me that a lot of the time we're spending, you know, let, let's teach them how to do things but never teach them, you know, to go back to your initial analogy, uh, you know, I don't want her to know how to do things. I want her to know why not to. <laughs> well, yeah, f f f f fair enough. And a, a, a good operator understands both. Yes. That they spend the time to get the education, whether it's through a formal institution or it's spending the time to kind of look, listen, and feel uh, to, of what's out there and the lessons learned of others to make sure and see and see how they fit, fit into their life and and are they doing um, the right thing you know for for success to have the outcomes they're looking for because it's easy to get complacent and to um, and when, once you you do get complacent you set a new standard and it happens over time it happens over and over and over again and pretty soon you're somewhere where you don't want to be in your training. So you, you, it always starts at the mastering the basics and then building out from there. One of the things you told me quite a few years ago that has stuck with me is, is that your standards are not what you say they are. They're what you tolerate. That, that's exactly right. And that is, that has stuck with me for years. Um, because it is, it is true. It's, it's like you said, you know, the, the when you're teaching the how and you're not teaching the why, the why gets lost and it's very easy for the how to shrink. So your skill set, the breadth of your skill set shrinks because you no longer understand why you need the breadth of the skill set. Yeah, absolutely. So there was one, at one point during, you know, the height of the conflicts in, in Iraq and Afghanistan is that um, some of the SEAL teams were basically not even doing diving anymore. And, 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 and so, so they weren't prepared for a contingency should it have arrived. And, and, and that's one of the basic pieces of being a SEAL is combat swimmer operations. And you have to make sure that you do, you know, it's hard, it's difficult to, to, to put 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound bag, but you got to spend the time to do it. And you have to do it and, and, tra and train and prepare for the worst possible circumstance. You know, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. It's not the other way around. Well, and I think that that's very easy to get lost. You know, I, I, I recently interviewed Jonathan Mattingly, who was, you know, the sergeant that led the Breonna Taylor raid. And one of the things we talked about is that that, that warrant was going to be an easy warrant. Like the, he said, just give me the easy one. Like, we'll, we'll take the easy one. And he's, he had done 2000 warrants at that point. And 2000, number 2001 or whatever was not the easy one. And, and so I think if you are not, preparing for worst case scenario when it does arrive you are wholly unprepared for it yeah and so so you need to assume every time the worst is going to happen and, and 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 approach it that way i i can remember when i was in charge of uh training all the west coast seal teams and we had a desert training area out in island and there was times when you know at noon in the summer doing immediate action drills of practicing enemy contact with full body armor and kit. It's not fun. And it doesn't make you popular with your troops. It, it, it does not. It does not make you popular. But 
you, you do what you have to do because at the end of the day, it's about bringing everybody home. Going back to the warrant, it's about bringing everybody back from that warrant, you know, and making sure that everybody's safe and sound and that it's executed flawlessly. That's what you should be striving for every time. Because the enemy, whether you're you're a SEAL going into combat or you're somebody serving war, the enemy gets a vote. <laughs> they, get, they get a vote on what happens. So um, this is one of those times where control, ultimate control, is an illusion. And you have to, you know, plan on others... Um, in trying to influence the situation frequently in a negative way. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So, okay. So you, you do five years, South America, float around team to team. They send you to Naval postgraduate school in Monterey, California, which is obviously when you grew up in San Diego, going to Monterey is a completely different world. That, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> the beach is on a cliff as opposed to on the sand. <laughs> right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The surfing's not as good there. Yeah. But, but, but still. Yeah. yeah. But still. <laughs> yeah. And, and then so from, from there I went and, and did time as, as the, uh, the pet seal and the third fleet staff. Uh, so it was a, they, so every, every uh, fleet needs a pet seal. So I was the one there, you know, helping train the battle groups and to uh, the, the seals that were at that time riding the amphibious ready groups and the, uh, the carrier battle groups. Um, bounced to, uh, Took over a schoolhouse in Mississippi where I was training foreign nationals how to do maritime riverine operations. Um, then that puts us about to the year 2000, and I was tapped to run the training for all the West Coast SEAL teams when they were the SEAL community was reorganizing. At that point, you're a lieutenant commander? I was a lieutenant commander, yeah, yeah mm -hmm, at that point. And then uh, f f from there, uh, well, 9-11 happened. You know, I can remember being in at the, the training command at the time. And, you know, it was uh, 5.30 something in the morning and, you know, TV was on and uh, watching watching everything unfold and saying, you know, the, the world's going to change. And it did. So, uh, I mean, at that point, how long had you been at BUDS at that point? Um, I was, uh, so I was training the West Coast SEAL team for probably, I'm guessing nine months, time, eight months. So you've got, you have BUDS and all of the other additional training stuff under your department. Yeah, so so actually BUDS itself, the schoolhouse, was a separate entity. Okay. So so but I had all of the operational teams. Okay, got it. Yeah. Just got it. So nine eleven happens and So so then it's just immediately, you know, get everybody ready and try to get them out the door. So we did everything from try to bring desert patrol vehicles out of mothballs you know, to get them because we didn't have ground mobility because that's not the war we were training for, for Afghanistan. We were, I mean, and this is not just an indictment on, on naval special warfare. And I don't think it's a fair indictment. It's more of the military and the Department of Defense as a whole is that we weren't prepared for that type of conflict. We didn't have the mobility. Uh, so we were cannibalizing vehicles. We were um, doing what we could to try to get the forces over there as fast as possible. And so, and then we, uh, large deployments there until 2003 when Iraq happened. And then kind of the focus was then split between Iraq and Afghanistan. At that point, I'd become the group one operations officer, which is, and group one is oversees all the West Coast SEAL teams. So, and I was the operations officer until I took command of, uh, of one of the SEAL units down in Coronado. Okay. And so then you end up taking command like getting a command, which team did you get? I had the special special boat team twelve. So okay. I was in charge of all of the mobility uh, for the West Coast SEAL teams. Got it. Mm -hmm. Where do you go from there? Well, I went to be in um, the Office of Legislative Affairs for U.S. Special Operations Command. So I was uh, the SEAL that oversaw, you know, basically represented U.S. SOCOM um, on Capitol Hill on the House and the Senate with authorizers, appropriators to make sure that they got the resources that were needed. So you were the one that was shaking Congress down for money for it SOCOM? It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I got pretty good at it. I, I, I got pretty good at it. So, you know, over that period of time from 2001 until 2000 and probably seven-ish, we, I mean, the SEAL community went from and not the SEAL, the Special Operations Community went from about 33,000 people to an excess of 50,000. Um, so I mean, you saw meteoric growth 
of the organization, and that wouldn't happen without Congress and you know appropriating monies and resources to make sure that could happen. So, go back to the training. I mean, while you're while you're running training, command of training, um, there's also that's like rapid growth of SOCOM, right? That's where yeah. they they want to start to dramatically increase the number of teams and increase the number of units. And how did that affect you? Yeah, very challenging, especially if we want to maintain the standards. You know, when you grow something quickly, there's a real risk of dilution and capability. Um, so frequently you're sacrificing capability with numbers. And so that's one of those things we had to monitor um, a lot. And I, I would say that there was significant change I'm not saying there was a dilution in capability, but the, the culture changed. Um, to keep the standards um, evolved, uh, it, it's just it's just it's what happens um, with with massive rapid growth. You see the same thing in industry as, as you do in the military. When product lines, you know, you can't scale them, and if they scale them too fast. Frequently, you outrun your supply chain. Um, a myriad of different things can happen that affects overall quality. And so this is one of those things that U.S. SOCOM and the SEAL teams in particular have, have had to wrestle with, of maintaining the culture that they had of operational excellence and making sure that they could have the force strength and as far as numbers that they needed to be successful. How much were they trying to grow the the teams at that point? Like what, give me the kind of order of magnitude. Yeah, yeah. so... Uh, just off the top of my head, so they created two new SEAL teams in that period of time. So, I mean, these are two, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Um, but that into itself, I mean, we had three West Coast SEAL teams and we went to four. Um, so if you're looking at just a basic, simple math, that's, you know, 25% more SEALs in a matter of, you know, where it takes years to make a SEAL, you do that rapidly um, it, it, there, there are consequences. So how did you, cause I mean, obviously if you're tasked with training to some degree, you end up being the guardian of the standard, right? Like how do you, how do you manage that tension? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think the first step is that, you know, clearly there was a large team of people that were, that were trainers. And if you're not willing to make the sacrifice of put your very best people as your trainers, your very best. And it, it hurts. It hurts to take them out of the operational lineup. But you have to be willing to do that to keep the standards. And, and, if, and if you're not, be prepared to pay the consequences. It's that, that in and of itself is an interesting point because so often in both law enforcement and military, the guy that ends up going to training is the guy that's not a pointy into the spear. Right? Like you, you don't take the best and the brightest. You take the guys that you know, aren't the best and the brightest because you want the best and the brightest on the front lines. Yeah, but you but the whole key is you want to make many best and bright people, right? And you have to do that through a process. You have to have a kind of a codified process on how you do that. And you have to have the right people who have the training, who understand the difference between training and understand the education piece and who can fuse the two together to you know, impart capability and wisdom to those people that they're, they're training. It's, it's tough. It, it's, you know, and, and the, the Navy has a culture, um, and it was largely started by Hyman Rickover when he started the submarine force, is that people do what's inspected, not expected. So the key is, as a leader, you have to make sure that you are, you are the keeper of the standards. You have to do inspections. Uh, gear inspections is one thing, but it's also the experience Inspect the tactics. Make sure they make sense. That that they will bring everybody home. That it will accomplish the mission. And, and it, it's it's a tireless and never-ending job. But you you have to do it, or you will be unsatisfied with the outcomes. And especially in life and death situations, people will die. It's it's a, a really valid point. You know, I recently read a book that's very critical of, of dev group specifically, uh, you know, the teams, um, called code over country. And, you know, I think there's probably, you know, like any book, he has a perspective and it isn't necessarily a pro dev group perspective. 
But one of the points that he makes in the book is that that the issues that they've had were failures of leadership, not failures that, you know, he talks a lot about the unit culture and how it was very kind of enlisted driven culture. And, and it, it's kind of the, the point he ends up making, albeit maybe unintentionally, is, is kind of what you're saying, that as, a, as an officer, you are responsible for, for the standard and, and for enforcing the standards and not allowing kind of the operational aspects of the unit to erode those standards. How do you do that, though? Uh, you know, from, from your perspective, what have you seen work? Yeah, for, for, for me, is you have to have an alignment of three different things. You have to have accountability, responsibility, and authority. You have to make sure that those things happen at the right level. As, as a, for example, as a team commanding officer, is I had a training officer. He had, he had to know what his authority to make decisions, when it needed to come to me, when he could make the decisions. He knew what he was responsible for, and he knew that he was going to be held accountable. When those three things happen, almost you get success almost every time. But if any one of them is falling down, uh, it, it, you're you're setting yourself uh, for a problem. And, and in an organization, especially a bureaucratic organization, look inside the Department of Defense or in a federal government, or probably even in, in a large uh, police department or federal agency, frequently that doesn't happen. And it's not by um, by design is just over time and power and, and distribution and things, but it's key to make sure that they are aligned. To, again, to, it's about outcomes. Yeah. So the focus of the organization has to be the product. That's correct. And, and when the organization, there's a misstep or things don't do, go right, everyone should feel it. It shouldn't be just even though if my training officer, for example, didn't do something correctly or he something got screwed up, everybody needs to know. Not 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 to to lambast him because it affects everybody. It affects the organizational brand. You know, I, I talk about you know this in, in the SEAL brand. It's one of the strongest brand, brands on the planet without a brand manager. Nobody manages their brand. It's just over time, it's just become something unto itself. And and I think especially when there's so many different pockets of operational capability and, and you know, as many people as there, there are, you know, you, you try to channel it and hurt it with, uh, you know, an ethos and, 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 and a creed and all the things that they've created. But at the end of the day, it's about people. Once that's been done, it's holding people accountable based on what they're in and along the lines with their responsibility and make sure they have the authority to make the decisions. Yeah, it's one of the things I talk about when I teach culture centric leadership is the idea that, you know, I actually stole the line from you. People do what's inspected, not expected. Um, but if you don't get on the scale every morning, you're probably getting fat. Yeah. Right. If, mm -hmm. if you are not, you know, I always say the culture of your organization is, is like a reputation. Everybody has one. And if you're not paying attention to it, it's probably not a good one. Well, and the other piece of, of that that's that's important to, to factor in is that um, people, I think it's human nature. They train to their strengths, not to their weaknesses. For sure. And in a sense, I can go to the gym and see the, you know, the guys hovering around the bench press have got, you know, we'll call them chicken legs and ma m m massive chests, you know, because yeah. all they do is bench press. Yeah. So, so great if that's the look they're going for. Yeah. <laughs> But, but, you know, people train to their strengths and, and you truly have to be objective. You can't be, have somebody who will be objective before you, for you. So that person who's objective for you will tell you what your weaknesses are. So you know what to train to. And, and, and that's frankly, you know, in, in business, that's, it's a little easier because the numbers show. Yeah. You, you, you can go in and pull the numbers and see where your revenue is coming from, where your expenses are, are going. And, and you can kind of figure it out and discern it operationally. You have to make sure you're looking at tomorrow's potential battle. Potential. And you have to, worst case versus most likely, and you have to create a training regimen that trains the people's weaknesses, not to their strengths. I think it's very difficult to do, though. You know, I think it's, I think it's very easy to, to do, and I mean, I see it all the times with teams that I work with. Like, they'll run the same problems over and over again, and if they hit a difficult point in training, they'll just avoid it. Because it's difficult and it's awkward and nobody wants to have bad conversations and, 
Um, you know, it's, I, I think, I think that you, you lose skill, you lose operational capability, whether it's in business or, or tactical in drops. Yeah. And, and you don't realize until you needed those capabilities that they're gone. Yeah. And I do think part of this is having a organizational culture that embraces honesty and, and the fact that you, you know, the tell me my baby's ugly and I'll decide if it's going to get plastic surgery or not. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's kind of the key. And, and so the key to any, you know, after action is the honesty of the hot wash. And it, whether it's a senior or a junior, everybody should be able to say what went right, what went wrong without any, um, you know, blowback for, for doing it. That's, Cause that's the way you learn. And, and part of that is, you know, as everybody has to be able to laugh at themselves, you know, to a certain extent, because we all make mistakes because you know what, as long as you have humans involved, you will, mistakes are going to be made. But I think, I think it is very difficult in the modern world to create a culture of brutal honesty, right? We, we have kind of begun to not want to know that our ass looks fat in those pants and it's become very easy to so well, socially rude to say that. And it's, you know, it, it's a hostile workplace environment. And, you know, we, we are kind of, um, I remember when my son was in fifth grade, sixth grade, uh, the coach got up and gave a, a talk to the, to the parents about how they were going to teach the kids sports and they were going to do sports and we're going to doing all these things. But, and he kept using the word non-threatening, you know, we're going to play, you know, we're going to teach them to juggle. It's good for eye hand coordination in a non-threatening way. And, you know, and I walked up to him and he's, he's basically saying like, if your kid is a dork, um, you know, we're going to support him and let him know he's a dork. And, and I, I walked up to him afterwards and I said, Hey coach, you know, John Becker, you know, Jonathan's my son. And I said, uh, do me a favor. And if he sucks at something, let him know he sucks at it. Don't tell him he's, he's magic because I deal with too many people that come in looking for a job that nobody has ever bothered to tell them, Hey, like you suck at this. And if you want to get better at it, this is how you do it. But I think culturally, we're given a lot of fucking seventh place trophies right now. Yeah. And I think this is where the leadership comes in and has to make, if it was easy, it'd be done already. I mean, as far as creating a culture that can accept that kind of honesty. But at the end of the day, it's about saving lives and getting, the, uh, you know, being successful in, in, in the mission at hand. And, and you have to be able to, to be really honest uh, in order to educate and to train people to make sure that they're ready for what's going to come next. How did you, as, as they're trying to expand the teams, I imagine there is a point that you guys hit, you know, the, the like diminishing returns point for lack of a better term. Yeah, no, absolutely. Especially when you, we didn't increase the size of the training staff, your numbers are increasing your throughput. Each uh, person being trained received less time and you're still trying to get the same outcome. Um, it, it, it's, it's really difficult and you have to sit back and rethink about how you think about solving the problems. So you have to start thinking about the better mousetrap, how to do this on scale. How, how does this change? Do we need to tweak this? Do we need to tweak that? Are there things we can do to find economies so we can try to increase the time of, uh, of, of training and to make sure people have the time to get the iteration that they needed to do the repetition of, of training in order to create muscle memory. So, I mean, as you're doing that, when you hit the point of, of no return, how are you managing above you? Cause I'm imagining there's probably some downward pressure. Of course there is. Um, is that you, again, you have to, you know, there's times when you have to like salute and say, aye, aye, sir, and, 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 and get it done. But there's other times when you, you owe it to your seniors to tell them, here's the challenge and this is what I'm doing to mitigate it. So just don't dump the problem on, on their lap, and, but also offer that this is what I'm doing to, 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 to mitigate the problem. Do you have any suggestions <laughs> that might help? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I mean, help me, help me here. Well, that, that's kind of <laughs> it, right? Because I mean, at the end of the day, everybody works for somebody. Yes. Whether you're in business, you're working for your customers, or you're the president of the United States working for the American people, everybody works for somebody. But I think that it one of the challenges in working for people is you have to be willing to speak truth to power. And I think that that is very challenging in a high alpha environment like the one you worked in. Yeah, it is. And it do- doesn't always end well. <laughs> it doesn't. So, so you know, you've got to be able to take the licks and, you know, frankly, it's uh, and, and not make things personal when it is personal. You have to not wear it on your 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 your, sh- your shoulder all the time that uh, you know you, you got dressed down or or that the boss didn't see it the way you see it, but but you owe it to the boss to tell them, you know, this is the challenge you're facing, um, because at the end of the day, you're, you're not by yourself. This is you know frankly why they call them the sealed teams. You have you have a t- team of people and a culture that's focused on on teams working together to solve complex problems. So embrace it makes a lot of sense. What, um, so what else did you like at the time that you're doing the training, what else was there that like, what were the lasting lessons for you there? Um, you know, there, there's, there's several, um, I, I think I, I kind of touched on it earlier is, is you, you need to remain objective to your weaknesses and, and you, you, you really, cause we all have them and, and you have to just identify what they, what they are and just be cognizant of it, or you're going to be the guy at the bench press. You know, st- standing around. So again, you don't want to do do that. Um, you know, I always said that you know, kind of tactical lessons learned are kind of written in blood. You know, that's spilled on target. That's where we learn the tactical lessons. Operational lessons are, are le- learned in the newspaper, and strategic lessons are, are written in the history books. And, and and I say that because there's there's lessons all the time. That that but you got to be observant enough to discern them and to um, recognize them for what they what they are and be willing to apply them just because something happened I mean like you've had some great uh, um, um, folks on your podcast who tell some uh, of events that happen and just an amazing perspective on things there's something there for all of us to learn when you hear them and figure out how how does this apply to you and, and your team frankly um, whether it's a SEAL team or it's a law enforcement team, I, I, I think it's it's so important. Frequently, lessons learned are put in a book, put on a shelf, and never looked at again. Which is why we're doomed to repeat history. Over and over and over again. And again, I, I say this regularly, we haven't won a war since World War II. You know, and, and, and things aren't getting better. So we need to rethink about how we're thinking about the problem. Yeah, our our plan may not be working here. We're spending almost a trillion dollars a year. Yeah, it's a very valid point. <laughs> what time? So so when you leave training, you end up at at being the congressional liaison for SOCOM. What what do you learn there? Like, what is what is the big lesson of shaking Congress down for money? Yeah, and, and authority. So it's it's not just the money, but it's also to get the the rules changed, you know, in acquisition to make sure we can get the stuff we want in, in a streamlined fashion. It's about um, all kinds of different variables where where the law and policy come together. I, I think what I learned is uh, from that, you know, kind of that perch was where tactics, what's happening in the field as an operator, and policy and legislation mix. And, and, and what it looks like and how each one feeds each other. Um, I, I also learned that it's how much more valuable it is to, at least for me it was, to go from being an operator to kind of a policy legislative view and, instead of the other way around. It, having that experience of being, a, um, being in the trenches for a while gave me a, an amazing perspective on how sausage is made and how I can influence the recipe. That's a really good way to put that. Yeah, I think it's it's so much now in in business, in law enforcement and military, we see people coming out of school and going into the tops of organizations, right? Like apprenticeship is 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 not a thing anymore. Right? You you come in as a as a, you know, a, a trained genius and 
it has always struck me when I'm dealing with you know, somebody who's 23 with a backpack and a Stanford education, who's now at the head of an organization that they make really simple mistakes because they never had that low level experience that taught them all of those paradigms for decision-making that, that you don't get. I mean, that, 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 you know, again, that crossover between education and training, you, you can understand the why all day long. <laughs> If you don't understand the how, the application of the why gets a little dicey. Yeah, and it's also the, the understanding and anticipating what the second and third order, fourth, fifth order consequences for every decision are. And, and they're real. And frequently, policies and decisions are made um, where the second and third order consequence was way worse than the original thing they were trying to fix. You mean like us trying to fix terrorism in Iraq by removing Saddam Hussein? Yeah, like that one. Just as a theoretical? Yeah, that, that would be a good theory. Destabilizing a country to get yeah, it, just yeah, to get even? Yeah, and, and do away with the bath party, the glue that held the society together. Yeah. Oh, that one? Okay, yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, but see, again, you know, it's kind of like you look, at, you look at the recent, you know, exfiltration from Afghanistan and like we, we are making, we have policymakers that are making decisions without consulting people on the ground with the real operational experience. And that seems to be kind of a recurring theme in, in both the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan is this like, Oh, we're going to do this policy wise. And then, Oh, well, what do you mean that happened? It, and it's, it's like, it just feels like there's kind of a disconnect vertically in, in a lot of our organizations where, we are, and you see even with law enforcement and in the way that we're placing, you look at the city councils are like, oh, we're going to, you know, we're going to cut the law enforcement budget. We're going to cut the number of cops. Like, what do you mean crime went up? Like, what'd you think was going to happen? <laughs> right. Exactly. But, but they didn't. Um, how do we, fr from your perspective, cause you've been, you know, we, we haven't quite finished going through your career yet, but you've been on both sides of this, right? Like you, you've been on the policy side and you've been on the tactical side. How do we improve that? What, what is your perspective on that? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, and I wish I had, there was a really simple answer for it, but the, there isn't. I, I think it, and it really depends on, uh, would it, the way that we look in the Department of Defense is probably going to look different than it does at uh, LA Sheriff's Office. Um, but but I think what it really starts, where it starts is people talking together and, and recognizing that they don't know it all. That policy folks need to understand whether it's a city council, they got to sit down and recognize what they don't know. And this part of this is, is, is I do think there's opportunity for whether it's a city council or it's a senior policymaker actually being educated and trained. And, and, and I, I don't mean at, you know, uh, at GW university, I'm talking about by, let me say military people or, uh, or by uh, city council, by the, the by, by by the police department, is to actually conduct training and walk them through different scenarios tactically, so they can understand the consequences of things. And and it's work. It's 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 it's, it's not easy, but I think it, that's where it's going to have to start if it's going to happen on scale. It's funny. I was in law school when Rodney King happened, and I was working at police litigation. Was Rodney King happened just before I got into law school, so all the all the litigation is happening. And while I'm at police litigation, we're working on the Rodney King case, and we had a, cla a conversation in a class one night. And, and the professor was basically kind of ripping on LAPD and saying how you know this is ridiculous, they shouldn't happen this. And it was very clear that she had a fundamental misunderstanding of defensive tactics. Um, and, and so I finally just said, like, uh, Professor, how do you think police officers are trained? She goes, Well, they're all black belts. They're all black belts in, in martial arts, so they should just be able to do this without having, uses, having to use sticks. And, and, and she kind of looked over and saw the absolute look of horror on my face, I think. And she's like, well, I don't understand. Why do you have that look on your face? I said, because almost none of them are, and they get almost no defensive tactics training. Like, you don't, you don't even understand what's going on, do you? And, and it was the first time that I really realized, like, the, the public perception and, and the facts set that they are making decisions from and, and raising opinions from can be completely wrong. And, and if there isn't this moment where you go, hold on, 
that's not what happens, um, that, that you do end up with some really stupid policies and really stupid decisions. California right now is in the process of trying to ban bite dogs. Completely. They're, they're, gonna, they're trying to ban bite canines because there have been a couple of bad bites in, in a couple of city council members. And what they don't understand is the consequence of that is more people are going to get shot. Yeah, they will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's an approach. I would say not a good one, but it's yeah. an approach, right? I mean, it's, it's definitely safer for law enforcement. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, if we, if we just shoot them, then, then that's a simpler problem, but it's, it's not going to solve the societal aim that we're, we're trying to solve. No. And generally, if there are, I think we've reached the point in society, there aren't a lot of really simple answers to complex problems. Yeah. So you have to be willing to do your homework and figure out and work your way through the complexity of the solution to the, com- to the complex problem. I also wonder at times if part of the reason that there aren't a lot of, of simple solutions is because we are spending too much time on the how, not enough time on the why. Like I, I use the example of my kids, you know, the first time your kid takes something that doesn't belong to them, you have, you have two lessons there. One is, you know, Billy, don't take that piece of candy. The other is don't take things that aren't yours. Billy, don't take that, take that piece of candy is the how, right? You don't take things that aren't yours is the why. If he understands the why, he, you're not going to then end up saying, and don't take that toy, and don't take that other thing, and don't, you, you know, you just, you don't take things that aren't yours. And I feel like we've kind of gone away with leaders. We've gone away from really fundamental leadership training, and, and we're more focused on management. We're more focused on, you know, you know, what time do your people come in and what time do they leave and not focusing enough on what are they supposed to be doing? Yeah, absolutely. Because leadership and and management aren't the same. Oh. And many people lump them together. I would say systems are managed. People are led. That's exactly right. You can manage quality. Yeah. You can manage air conditioning systems. You can manage IT systems um, because they they are self-governing in a different way. Human beings have to be led. They do. Um, and I, I do think that where you know, the operators can help their leaders, and I'm going to say policymakers, is they kind of have to sometimes put your, put your head in their space to see how they see the world. I think that's really important. Um, and, and I don't know that that happens enough, whether it's in the... the the, the military or in law enforcement. I mean, because at the end of the day, policy needs a forcing function. It doesn't change on itself. You will use your dog bite. And it, you, you said it was a result of some nasty dog bites. Something happened. And so a poli- it was a forcing function for that policy to change. You know, sometimes it requires, you know, death or suffering, you know, to move it in, in the wrong direction or even to move it in the right direction. I think people hunt and people say, well, wh- why don't there, our leaders do this? And say, because something bad enough hasn't happened to force the policy to change. And, and that's just, it's an unfortunate reality. But it is, I mean, in the world where everybody's dying from task and information toxicity, the only things that get detention are the, the, the most important things that are sitting on somebody's desk. And again, that's usually the forcing function that drives, you know, the change. Yeah, and I think it's very easy for the urgent in that case to crowd out the important too. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like the thing that's on fire becomes the thing that you're paying attention to. You know, you're 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 paying attention to the the teams are constantly on the ground in Iraq, engaged in desert warfare and, and you know, local urban warfare, not diving. Right, exactly. So, you know, well, well, why why take them out and make them dive? Yeah, and again, so it's that balance of worst case versus most likely. Right? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, so in the, the other things I, I think that, that are important is that people have to recognize and, and really understand and objectively understand what their organizational culture is. Because culture will trump strategy. They'll eat it for lunch every day. So you can have the best strategy in the world, but if you don't have the culture, organization culture, whether it's the ability to be candid with each other, is to train to, to weaknesses, not strengths, it's not to truth to power. If you, if you, or, you know, frankly, um, you know, senior leaders, uh, you know, inspecting work. 
that's being done, expecting the tactics tr and, and looking at it, then the, your, the best strategy isn't going to make any difference. It's not going to work. I remember when I first started Aardvark, inspection was a culture, was a heavy culture in law enforcement. And it was a regular thing. That has changed over the course of my career um, to the point that I was recently with a team that were doing um, force on force stuff, mm -hmm. Sims stuff, and was horrified because everybody cleared their own guns. There was no secondary inspection. And, and I remember the team leader saying, you guys are all grown men. Make sure you have an empty gun. And, and it just struck me as like secondary inspection exists for a reason. It does. And, and it, and it isn't because I don't think you don't care. It's because sometimes you make a mistake. That human thing again. Yeah. Yeah. Humans make mistakes. It, it just, it just takes a second to be thinking of something else and miss a step. Yeah. And the thing that you, you, you know, you and I have talked about in the past is, is you're, you're taking people where they are, right? And, and sometimes they are at the height of their powers and the peak of their game, and they are sharp and completely focused on their job. And sometimes, you know, they're in the middle of a divorce and drinking too much, and their dog just got run over by a car, and you've got 25% of their capability manifest. And so that's where an inspection catches it. It does, because we, we all have stuff going on in our own personal lives. And some days that it frankly it affects us more than others. Yeah, a friend was a pilot and we were talking about checklists and, and I'm like, you know, why, why do, why do you guys use checklists? Like you're, if you've been flying a long time, like why do you need a checklist? And he said, you need a checklist because if you make a mistake, people die. And he goes, I said, well, they like, you just, you know, you know, the checklist, don't you just kind of go through the checklist. He goes, I read the checklist every time and I read it out loud. And, my co-pilot verifies what I said. And I said, that's very inefficient. And he said, yes. And so is killing 300 people in an airplane. And he said, you, you, your culture has to be focused on preventing any type of mistake. And the only way that happens is to be inefficient, to create intentional obstructions because, you know, the, the path, to, you know, the path of least resistance is downhill and off a cliff. Right. So one of the things I used to do is I, I used to look at, um, you know, what can go poorly? And then I would take the kind of, well, my mind, okay, we're at investigation and work backwards. What could I have done to have mitigated, whether it's combat swimmer training operation, is how do I prevent a boat from coming from out of nowhere and running over one of my dive teams? Uh, how, how do you make sure if somebody's jumping out of a plane that their parachute opens? What can I do to, pre to prevent a malfunction? You know, it, so in, in the training phase, you go through all of that stuff and, and, and you, you, you build it in and it just bleeds over and it becomes second nature in when, when, when a real world operation is in progress. Because you, you, you just have to and you got to spend the time to do it. I mean, even on my own personal boat, I have checklists. I have checklists when I leave at the end of the day because I don't want my boat sinking. <laughs> yeah. To make sure I don't forget the, the one step that keeps it afloat that night. It's funny. I, I, we were, I was working on a military contract years ago, and we had a subcontractor that was making a, a explosive device for us. And we, we had a DCMA inspector that you know, had to come out and do safety inspections on the subcontractor. And he called me um, before the meeting and said, hey, I know this is your subcontractor. I have some very strong concerns. I've been to this facility. And you know, I'm very troubled by these things. And, you know, as I wonder if you can meet me and we can have a conversation. And so I, I said, sure. And I flew into, uh, you know, we had, to, it was a place you had to drive to. And so I flew and met him and rode in with him. And, um, you know, I said, I, I just, you know, these guys have done this a really long time. They're really good at this, but I don't understand where, you know, cause at this point I'm still, this is my subcontractor. I'm going to defend them. And so we're having this conversation as we're driving as a four, four hour drive. And so we have a long time to talk. Nice guy. Just, I think he's overly cautious and, and kind of annoying. And, you know, I'm like, I don't understand your concerns and blah, blah, blah. And, and so he kind of expressed some misconcern. He goes, do me a favor. He says, uh, my, my bag is behind my seat. He goes, there's a notebook in the bag. We pull it out. And I said, sure. And you know, I pull it out. And he goes, just, just look through it. 
just just flip through the pictures that are in that notebook and 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 and, and the pictures are literally smoking hole after smoking hole right these are all ammunition factories that have blown mm. up and explosive factories that have blown up and you know that you know, you know yeah no that there were 35 people killed in that that accident there are 20 people have killed in that accident I said, okay. I said, well, why are you having me do this? And he goes, those people were all much better at their jobs than your subcontractor is. So we're going to do a really thorough inspection. <laughs> <laughs> After that, yeah. and, and it changed my culture about safety, though, because just, just the words, those people were all much better at their jobs than your subcontractor is. And there's this moment of like, oh, yeah, no, that's. And these were, you know, some of those were like big defense contractors who, you know, do this like really do this for a living. Right. And, and it, it changed my attitude towards inspection in a way that it's never gone back. And, uh, and I, I think, I think you make a really valid point. But I think professionals understand why you need inspection. I, I think it is one of those discerning differences between a real professional and somebody who does the job. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, okay, so let's let's go back in time. So now, you're you're getting towards the end of your military career, right? You're you're mm-hmm. congressional liaison, liaison to SOCOM. Um, what makes you decide it's time to retire? There was a series of different things. Um, I, th- I think uh, I, one of the things I've always had the ability to do is to be kind of objective about where I am and what I want to do and what I, frankly, I don't want to do. Um, so I was selected for promotion to, to captain. Um, and I saw that, you know, there was some stuff going on in my neighborhood as far as congressional seats and the way things were going. And we had a, um, I knew folks that were coming into the, the you know, that were running for, um, the presidency and, and, uh, and I guess at that time was 2008. And it just made sense that I didn't want to spend the rest of my career making PowerPoint slides in a cubicle in the Pentagon. So it just seemed like, uh, kind of, it was time for me to go and do something else. And, and, you know, cause I think there's many ways to serve and it's not in always in uniform or, there's just many ways to, to to serve the American people, so I chose a different path. So you declined promotion and retire. I did, but they weren't done with you yet. No, they weren't. So, <laughs> so, so, so essentially, what happens is that you know I go into the private sector for a while, and that I get asked to come back to government. Um, so I ended up going to be the deputy chief of staff at the Department of Veterans Affairs, which started a pathway over to, um, I was traded like a ball card from Rick Shinseki to Bob Gates over the, to the Department of Defense. And I was went there and served as the um, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Special Operations at the time, I was the senior civilian overseeing the entire special operations community. And then I, I kind of bounced around through the administration um, by the time it was done, I did a stint as the Undersecretary of the Policy, which at the time was the number three position at the Pentagon, did a, a, a stint as a uh, Senate-confirmed Assistant Secretary for Special Operations and Low-Intensity Conflict. And in the last year of the administration, I was asked to go over and do the counter-ISIS messaging to STEM recruiting uh, for ISIS internationally to join their cause. You know, the the assignments themselves were kind of interesting. I mean, they, they were great. I mean, I got exposed to all kinds of some amazing things. But I also got to do some, some I'll, I'll call them special projects, or work different things um, that I would have never, ever had exposure to. And I think it was that mindset of what I brought from the special operations community that made me kind of uniquely suited to take on some of these tasks and to have my seniors recognize that I could... Uh, and would be successful at these tasks. And they, you know, at VA, it was in implementing the uh, 2010 Omnibus Caregivers Act. This was a uh, Congress decided that, you know, the number of service members that have been that were sick, injured, or ill uh, from service, uh, many of them had caregivers, family members, that they should get stipends and get health care. And and so I I worked that 
program to get that fully implemented at, at VA. Worked with some really talented folks at VA to make that happen. Over at DOD, in addition to doing my counterterrorism special operations oversight, I also was asked to reorganize the POW MIA effort in the Department of Defense. This is bringing home our, our uh, missing in action um, and, and, we, and, and looking for, you know, continue to look for POWs from prior conflicts all the way back to, to, to World War II. Um, I, I was tasked with negotiating and executing the recovery of Sergeant Bo Bergdahl from Taliban custody. He'd been in custody for five years, um, almost five years by the time that I was given the mission and we got him home in a matter of months um, by being able to, to uh, channel the resources. And then my, kind of the other um, project of, of size and magnitude that I was able to, to lead was uh, running the DOD's uh, task force to eradicate Ebola from West Africa. I remember that. Well, let's, let's, um, let's go back first to when you get to ASD Solik mm -hmm. um, with what at the time I think I called the most fortuitous timing in history. Um, I think you started on a Monday and Osama bin Laden was killed like the following Friday or yeah, something. Yeah, it was. Uh, I think I started on the twenty second of April, and you're talking one May, so it was, it was literally a week. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, week. I remember calling you and saying you are either the most ruthlessly efficient person on planet <laughs> Earth or the luckiest guy I know. <laughs> I, I, I wish it was the former, but yeah. I, it's, it's, let's be honest, it was the latter. Yeah. Here's your new business card. Here's your parking spot. By the way, we know where bin Laden is. Are you cool if we go get him? <laughs> What was that? I mean, what was that like walking into that? Because that's obviously, you have to realize at the time, that is going to be probably the most historic event you'll ever participate in. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's interesting. Is it, I mean, it just made me respect the team that did all the heavy lifting on that. And it was, truly was an, an effort between the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, um, as well as a myriad of State Department, a myriad of other you know government agencies who worked together, people that were focused, so singularly focused on a single task, um, just grinding for years, grinding for years, and obstacle after obstacle put in front of them, and them either going over the obstacle or going around it. But it was key; is they didn't let anything stop them. Yeah, I think one of the things that I I think is very, you know, I don't know, it's, it, it's one of the things you have to admire with the U.S. government, and, and it's true of other governments, the Israelis certainly, but like there is a point where you've pushed the button with us, and there's going to be somebody who it is their entire life to just solve you as a problem. And, and Bin Laden was such an example of that where it took so long and they had to be so patient to do it that it's, it's you know, it's really impressive. Again, just phenomenal people who, who uh, committed, just committed to the mission. Yeah. And at the time, you have to realize that's significant. Oh, absolutely. Like It, it, it showed actually coming into the DOD at that level at that time, it, it basically showed me what, what is possible. It, so, so sometimes it, we forget what is possible. And, and, and when you see it like so quickly upon arrival, it kind of focuses you on, and you, 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 I think on this, even in this talk here, we have used the term outcomes a lot. To me, it's about the outcomes. And so if you, if you truly understand the outcome and you're really, truly committed it, and you have the passion, you'll do whatever it takes to make it happen. Yeah. And, and I use that to kind of approach those other things that I talked about that I was able to, to work on in projects that uh, all were successful, about putting a team together, creating the right culture, focus on the outcomes, channel and manage the resources, and just get it done. Well, and while your AST Solik uh, extortion happens, right? It did, yeah. So we had that uh, uh, unfortunate shoot down of Extortion One Seven, the helicopter carrying members of the uh, uh, Army uh, Air Crew as well as the the Navy SEALs and and support folks. Yeah, so it was it was a uh, uh, that that was horrific. How did how from your from your vantage how did that play out? Like, walk me through that. Well, I mean, first there was the notification that it happened. And the one, the one thing I've learned over the years, information that you get 
is Fred, the first that kind of bit of information is never accurate. So, you know, I had heard a, a helicopter w w was shot down. Um, I was going, okay, uh, I might have some casualties, and which is a bad day unto itself. But when I, I heard that it was the worst possible scenario, um, it just was like a throat punch. Especially when you, I mean, there was guys that I went to buds with that were on that helo. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, it, so there was the, you know, the professional thing, but there was also the personal. Yeah. Of, of of knowing them and uh and knowing them well and then it was just the, the having patience i had to have a certain amount of operational patience because it takes time for the information to get through the food chain to, to, to get up to to me so i know what's going on so i can report to my seniors so i can do my oversight mission that i'm supposed to um supposed to do and and not just pick up the phone and call down and start. Yeah, I, I need it now because start dropping things on people. Well, that actually slows the process, and and it's and sometimes you know you don't want to be that person, and so that that was a really tough thing for me to do, is just uh, you know operational patience as the senior leader who wasn't there when it happened, wasn't in country when it happened, um, and, and then after that it, it turned into kind of picking up the pieces. And I think it's the first time that I ever really saw the firsthand the impact of, I'll call it disinformation or mistruths on the internet or the conspiracy theories about what happened, why it happened. Because when you have a special operation helo with a, a premier special operation team, you know, shot down, somebody clearly screwed up. I mean, so so that was the narrative, right? That was out there floating around because, again, people forget the enemy gets a vote too. Yeah. So the immediate thing was is that you know I heard everything from we made a trade uh, with, with with the Taliban and uh, for for getting Bin Laden back, we sacrificed these great Americans. I heard uh, just all kinds of nonsense, um, and and frankly, the Department of Defense spent a lot of effort trying to dispel those that that disinformation that was going on with family yeah. and, and just just across the board um but it, it, it i was really this this sounds trite and i don't mean it to but i was like so disappointed in frankly the lack of faith that some people in this country had that somebody would actually do that. Yeah, that that's a reprehensible idea. And, and it, it was, it was, yeah. So that those, I was in some dark days for a while after that. Be, I mean, first of all, there was the event that happened again that was so horrific. But then it was all that aftermath, and and for for months there was, and and I can understand why families were distraught, losing loved ones. You know, some of them on their you know, seventh, eighth deployment or more. Yeah. And to, to turn around and have it, this happen. Um, yeah. So uh, th those, those were some dark days for me. What'd you learn from it? I, I think, you know, it's, it's, I, I actually learned, uh, several things. First of all, I, I think it, not so much I learned, but it highlighted is sometimes as a leader, you have to have operational patience. You truly have to sit on your hands and and let things play out um just to just to find out you know the truth and make this make the system work i think that's thing one thing two i learned the information component of every operation is not an afterthought it has to be baked in so in, in the military they call it information operations but also, I would say, whether it's a police department or a, a, in any agency, you have to make sure you understand how you're going to react if something doesn't go right. And what are you going to do if it does go right? What is going to be your response to the media? This should be prior to the operation, not afterwards. Um, had, we, had the Department of Defense been better prepared uh, from, from a public affairs stance and an information operations, I, I think it would... We wouldn't have had, and we would. We, the event was going to happen. 
it happened, but it would also be, we wouldn't have had the, the significance of the uh, conspiracy theories and everything else that went with it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. We see a lot of, of failure of that, especially in law enforcement right now. Um, you know, there are so many cases where something happens and the conspiracy theorists take off, you know, or, or just the media. You know, we've, we've kind of developed a media that, that you know, hijacks our, our environmental or our, our evolutionary biology. And, you know, we like to be fed bad news and they're great at feeding us bad news. And so they take that initial inaccurate information and they run with it. You know, and, and Brianna Taylor is a perfect example of that, where when you understand what actually happened in the case, I mean, you had, you had the future vice president of the United States go on TV and say that the, they were at the wrong house, that they served a warrant on the wrong house and killed a poor, innocent woman who was in the house. And then you realize, no, actually, she was a target of the investigation. It was her house. They were supposed to be there. But here's the vice president of the United States, LeBron James, Beyonce, you know, Alicia Keys, all with giant, loud microphones and, and the news media saying this, that they hit the wrong house. And that becomes the narrative for a long time. And what we didn't see was the Louisville Police Department coming out and saying, well, no, 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 hold on. Here's a search warrant. Here's what happened. Here's the information. I think sometimes it's, it's easy to kind of hunker down and think, oh, the storm's going to pass. And, and I don't know that it always is going to. And sometimes you have to be ready to respond aggressively with, with media. Well, and if you don't control the narrative, Somebody else will. Yeah. And, or at least you're leaving it open for them to control the narrative. And once you surrender it, it is so hard to get back. It is so hard. And this kind of led me, you know, ultimately over to the State Department yeah. to do the counter ISIS messaging, where, you know, for there, you know, my, my takeaway is that how people, how vulnerable people are to what's on the internet and how they listen to things that, you know, frequently, the more outlandish, the more they lap it up. And and, and, it, it, and I, get, I think it goes back to that human nature thing you were talking about, to try to believe the unbelievable or the, the thing that's, you know, the, the, the negative of why somebody else is, you know, working against their, their, their best interest. So let's, let's talk about that, the State Department job, because it was you you stood it up, right? It was kind of, you were tasked with standing that thing up. Yeah, I mean, there's something existed previously, um, but it was deemed, uh, not by me, but by others, to be ineffective. So they um, they created this new entity called the Global Engagement Center, uh, which, which was designed to engage globally, uh, you know, th those people that were potential recruits for ISIS and other, you know, extremist organizations. And by engage, you mean counter messaging, uh, you know, on the one hand, you could say marketing. On the other hand, you could say propaganda. Yeah, you can. It, it depends on, you know, your, your perspective, yeah. right? Yeah, it's terrorist just, freedom fighter. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, and the way, you know, government was largely does things, you know, they do things on scale. They think about, you know, let's do some yeah, in information operations, let's drop flyers, you know, from an airplane or, or let's put something on TV or let's, so, so you end up with this big message trying to hit a bunch of people in a generic kind of way, hoping it lands on those one or two or three people that are potential recruits. Historically, that's the way it's, it's happened. You know, with social media, what it is today, like I, I can, I can buy audiences, which means I, I can go and figure out who all 18 to 35 year old military age males in Morocco uh, subscribe to AK 47 blogs and, and have looked at X number of videos on of Abu, um, you know, Abakar, so Baghdadi. I mean, we, 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 we could, you can buy that audience. And you know what? I can influence what they see on their social media feeds. I can buy ads and send them to them. I, I, I can literally micro target what people look at on their computer what they see um and i tell you what if you have alexa at home or something else let's make it just that much easier <laughs> right so yeah, no that's if you have alexa at home turn her off <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so i mean if if people understood how much they give away about who they are as a person based on their internet searches, 
and their Facebook or, or any other thing and how vulnerable they make themselves. Not just to, you know, I mean, to foreign adversaries, but also to just, just to bad people. The people they, they understood, I think they'd do a heck of a lot less uh, of, the, of social media. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's funny because I remember when you first went there, we had a conversation about it and it's, you don't like, like, you know, as a business, you do that all the time, right? Like that is, that is Google stock and trade, right? Google says, here's a free search engine because now I know everything you search. So then when somebody wants to sell you something, I know exactly how to target you. And, you know, there, there's a limited amount of privacy that, that kind of makes it, impossible for me to find Michael Lumpkin through Google as a business, but it doesn't make it impossible for me to find, you know, somebody in this age group who was, you know, in, in who belongs to a SEAL group, who also belongs to a, you know, policy wonk reading group. Uh, and, and, oh, wow, look at that there that we found Michael. Um, I, I think, I, I do think it is terrifying. The farther I dug into it, the, the more terrifying it was. It's it's hard to believe that the U.S. government wasn't doing that. Yeah, they, they effectively. Were, yeah, they, they weren't buying. I, I call it buying audiences because yeah. those are services you buy, right? Yeah, so, totally. so and, but but yeah, that they, they weren't doing that on, in in this kind of fora. So we, we ended up changing that. We built something that I think really did have a significant impact on recruiting efforts for ISIS. I mean, ISIS isn't dead yet, and they're they're still out recruiting. I mean, and and they've got a. Uh, and the Global Engagement Center, the State Department, all the agencies need to continue to adapt to the new social media uh, trends and and stay ahead of them. Yeah, I mean it's 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 funny because it has become information warfare, with, with, without a doubt. It it, it truly is. It and, is. And it's 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 almost like the kinetic warfare now is trailing the information. And the, the effective use of the information leads to the kinetic. Well, I mean, f- frankly, kinetic is, um, the, the problem with kinetic is that, you know, if we drop a bomb on somewhere, we're going to rebuild it, likely, you know, yeah. as, as, as a nation. Information, I, I, I can get people to change their behavior to, if I don't want them to go into a building instead of destroying it, I can probably do an information campaign to tell somebody there's a bomb in there and they don't want to go in the building. Is it, so, I mean, there's all things kinds of things you can do with the message to influence behavior, both positively and negatively, if you understand the audience and you understand the tools that are that are in front of you. Well, and our world adversaries are all using it negatively against us. Oh, absolutely. A- a- absolutely. So, I mean, if you go to, you know, uh, Vladimir Putin, he basically ran the information operations program when he was, you know, in, in, in uniform. The, the the point is that this is like in his DNA. Yeah, and, and and for us, it's historically it's been an afterthought. I I think we're doing much better than we used to, but when I got to the start State Department, they were only spending five million dollars on counter messaging. Five million dollars. Yeah, and and frankly, that's salaries. That's you know for people, wasn't a lot of money. So, yeah, so I mean, they're spending less on Google AdWords than, you know, probably uh, a small, uh, you know, betting company or, you know, shoe company is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the, the budget's higher now. We, yeah. we, we work to great, raise the budget. But I mean, and frequently people, if they don't understand information warfare or information operations, it's usually the first thing to get cut when you're looking to save money. Kind of like training. Kind of. Which, kind, of like, kind of like, I mean, it's, it's interesting because you see it in law enforcement all the time. Uh, you know, what gets cut are, are proactive programs. You know, what gets cut is kind of the community-oriented policing. And, we're you know, the, the departments, especially when they get the kind of funding cuts that, you know, Portland and Seattle and San Francisco have, is the department becomes reactive. Neighborhood crime task forces go away. Proactive organized crime task forces go away. And what ends up happening is the law enforcement is less able to prevent crime from occurring. And as a result, has a bigger responsibility to react to it. Yeah. And again, this is, I, I don't, I mean, here, here's what I want to believe, but maybe I'm naive. I, I don't think, you know, your city leaders 
want that to be the outcome. I just don't think they understand the second and third order consequences. So I, I do think that this goes back to my comment earlier about having to educate them on what the impacts are going to be of those decisions. Because at the end of the day, they get to make the decision, right? Just like the, uh, you know, the, at the end of the day, the Congress and the President of the United States get to make decisions. But I think it's important for whether you're wearing a uniform or you're a policymaker and you have a view on it to make sure that they know what you, what the, the consequences of those decisions are going to be. So at least they're sober when they're making the decisions. So, Michael, I'd like to go back and just pick up a couple of things that we touched on, but but I want to just probe a little deeper. Um, at the point that you are ASD Solik, I guess we should probably explain what that is because we're kind of assuming it, and, and I know that the entire audience it, it understands it. So let's start there. Tell me what ASD Solik is. A ASD Solik is the Assistant Secretary of Defense, hence the ASD, for Special Operations Low Intensity F Conflict. It basically oversees uh, U.S. Special Operations Command and, and policy, as well as uh, special mission areas like uh, counterterrorism, counter narcotics. Um, you know, all kind of a the, all the cats and dogs that don't fall anywhere cleanly. Uh, st uh, stability operations. I call it always kind of the kitchen junk drawer of uh, of policy stuff within the Pentagon. And and just so people understand kind of the relationship between, I don't think the average American understands the relationship between the civilian side of our government and the DOD side of our government. Maybe give us a little yeah. civics so, lesson. I mean, so, so there, our country's kind of uh, founded on civilian oversight of the military. And so U.S. Special Operations Command doesn't work for a service. I mean, it's kind of its own combatant command that's kind of sitting out there, and it has members of each of the services. Operationally, it kind of reports up to the Secretary of Defense, but uh, but from an administrative point of view, uh, to today, uh, not originally envisioned this way, but today, uh, U.S. Special Operations Command, U.S. Special Operations Command, uh, is under the administrative oversight of ASD Solik. So administratively, so we're talking about budgeting man, train, and equip, as well as policy oversight of our special operations capability in this country. So it's it's all of our military reports in to civilian leadership. It does. Yeah. And, and kind of it's what's so unique to our democracy. I mean, our founding fathers were, I mean, their foresight is just, just amazing. But it keeps, you know, it's part of the, you know, checks and balances system. So we don't have a military that kind of runs amok. Yeah, I always tell people, like, you don't understand until you read the Constitution and, and read, like, the Federalist Papers, that they were not trying to build an efficient government. They were trying to prevent an efficient government. They were trying to balance powers, and they were trying to prevent the evils that they saw, that they fled, uh, you know, in, in, in the form of England, in, in centralized control and broad governmental power and, you know, strong military being directly related to the king and all of these things, uh, you know, that, that to me, that was the greatest foresight of those guys is they saw way beyond their own capabilities um, to do something like this and create this civilian oversight to prevent DOD from staging a coup. Like, let's just call it what it is. Yeah, you know? uh, absolutely. Uh, and uh, it, it, it works. I mean, is it is it bumpy? Are there challenges? Are there issues? Sure. And some of them are uh, structural, and some of them sometimes are just personality based on folks who happen to be in the seat at the time. I had the good fortune to work when I was ASD Solak with some great, you know, special operations uh, command, uh, you know, commanders, guys the likes of uh, Bill McRaven and Tony Thomas, and and, and so I, I was very blessed with the, the relationship that I was able to have. As I walked the line between being an advocate for our special operations community and providing oversight. And, and it's a line and you have to keep focused on making sure that they're doing the right thing. But when it made sense to advocate from a budget perspective to the Congress or within the department to get into the bureaucratic battles that are necessary, um, to just effectively resource our special operations uh, capability in this country. Um, yeah, it's a line that has to be walked. Yeah. It is, historically, though, has that position been filled by a straight-up civilian? 
Yeah, I mean, a, yes, it's always because it's a political appointee, Senate confirmed. So it's not. But a, I mean, from a not from not from a appointment position, but from an experience standpoint, who has historically been in that role? Is it former military or is it? I, I th- we've had it where it hasn't been former military, um, but historically, um, I would say more times than not, it's somebody who came from the special operations community. I mean, my, myself, and then I had to, there was also Mike Sheehan, who had the job, who was a special forces guy. We had uh, Mike Vickers, who was a special forces guy. So we have a lit, had a litany of guys um, of, of both political parties, depending on which administration was in, in, in office, what party um, that, that came from the, the, the community. But it, it's, it is a political appointee, so obviously it is subject to the administration. But um, it's, it's kind of historically, aren't you more politically agnostic than potentially other parts of the government are? You know, it's, it's, it's a great question, and, and, it, and it, the answer is it really depends. I, I say that because there's kind of, I'll call it three kinds of folks who work in, maybe four actually, that work in like Department of Defense, for example. You have the uniform military, you have GS, government service, and GS civilians, um, you have contractors, and then you have political appointees. And each one has a completely different role and mission. Uh, a political appointee, they exist. They're nominated by the president to the Senate. The Senate either confirms or does not confirm after a series of hearings of that person for the job. The reason political appointees exist is to drive the president's agenda. And so it, it is generally somebody who's affiliated with one political party or not, or somebody becomes affiliated with a political party through the process. Got it. Yeah, and I guess that's one of the things that we've seen in the last decade probably is kind of the destruction and politicization of a lot of the GS positions. Um, you know, it's it, one of the things that I've, I've told people that, that the last couple of administrations, what's bothered me is the, kind of the undermining of the bureaucracy because to some degree the bureaucracy is the continuity it, that's it, it is, and it's, it's the a, stability. It, it is very much so. So when I was, my, I mentioned earlier, my last uh, um, job in the administration was over the Department of State. Well, I got fired on January twentieth, two thousand and seventeen, when the day that President Obama left office. The standard business rules in D.C. are, except for a handful of folks that are carried over from one um, party administration to the next party, is that it, you business rules are you resign. And there's an expectation you're going to resign, and the next president gets to appoint his, who he wants to drive, he or she wants to drive their agenda. So, yeah, because they want somebody who is aligned with them to accomplish what they want to get done. Yeah, because the, the Department of Defense is a large bureaucratic organization, right? I mean, it's just massive, you know, $860 billion and in, in, in just this behemoth thing. And, 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 and bureaucracy, I mean, I applaud what it is, but you have to recognize what it is and what it isn't. It standard, tries to standardize routine tasks. That's what a bureaucracy does. It fights change every step of the way. And, that, and that's the culture of what it is, right? Yeah. So, and you have to know that. So if you want to walk in there and say, I'm going to do wholesale change to this organization, okay, you're delusional. <laughs> you, you, you're, you're not going to. And it doesn't matter if you're the Secretary of Defense or, you know, you're, you know, just a, a, a GS-13 rolling in, you know, as a political point. It doesn't matter. You're not going to do wholesale change to the organization. They will fight you every step of the way. Yeah, so it's all governmental change is incremental. It, it is. And it's generally done by consensus as well. Yeah. So, so if it's a, if it's a large national policy, it's done by what does state think, what does DOD think, what does you know, uh, USAID think, and it's done by consensus. It's in incremental, so it's it's baby steps. So you really have to map out what you want to accomplish and the roadmap on how you're going to do it. Which I guess the upside to the system resisting change is it prevents tyranny. It does. It prevents you know somebody coming in and losing their mind and and trying to undermine all the institutions, but the, you know, it's almost like a, a, a big boat, right? Like it, it doesn't turn quickly. 
but it, it also doesn't turn quickly. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I was just say, the saying is, you know, it takes four four miles from an aircraft carrier to turn. Yeah. So you, you got to know where you want to go before you start, you know, yeah, messing least, with the helm. At right? least four miles in advance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's let's go back and just pick up a couple of things. Um, one of the things you mentioned was the the rescue of Bo Bergdahl. Yes. So how does how does that first pop on your radar and and kind of walk me through that event? Yeah, so I, I was uh, I had been con- recently confirmed as the uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, uh, and at the same time, my boss announced he was uh, leaving the department, so there was going to be a gap. So I was elevated to not only my day job of as ASD Solek, but I was also sitting in the desk of Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, so which I mentioned earlier, is I think at the time was the number three position at the Pentagon. And so I was over, put in charge of overseeing all of policy within the department. Um, so I, I was kind of dual had it at the time, and I think it was it was in December of 2013. Um, a video was released of of, of Sergeant Bergdahl that showed him in a um, he, he wasn't in a good state. Uh, he'd been in captivity for. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of almost five years at that point. Um, and so there was real concern. The decision uh, was made to go, we need to up the ante on in our effort to get him home sooner, just based on his, his physical state. So uh, I was tasked by then Secretary of Defense uh, Chuck Hagel um, to kind of oversee um, from the department's perspective, I understand there's going to be many players, but from the department's perspective on how to get him home. So, so you know, for, there was a quick mission analysis on how to do it. What we we knew it was going to uh, d- discussions had happened on how to do it previously. So we dusted them off. We looked at new alternatives, and it came down to like, listen, this is going to have to be a, a prisoner exchange. This is the way it's going to have to go. And so then it just got into the negotiating uh, via. Um, you know, a third party because we weren't going to talk and negotiate directly with the Taliban. So negotiating uh, um, in order to uh, with an intermediary nation in order to, to to get him home. So and we finally settled. And so and to be clear, uh, and you know, there's a lot of people who were was a, we'll call it mixed views on whether we should spend any effort getting him home. I was always of the opinion that listen, we have a Uniform Code of Military Justice, a legal system. If he is guilty of some illegal infraction, let the system work when he gets home. Yeah, because just to set the stage, he was, uh, he he walked away from his post. He abandoned and was kidnapped. That that's correct. So he was he was kidnapped by the Taliban after abandoning his post. After abandoning, so he left his base and was uh, uh, a- apprehended and and held. Uh, so, so, so then in, in my mind, it was just, uh, you know, you do what you have to do to get somebody home. No one's left behind. That, that's kind of the, the mantra of the military, and I, and, I, and I believe it to my core. So uh, this is one of those things after mission analysis, you, you put the team together and you start figuring it out how it's going to work. I had a great deputy, and we, we worked it and, uh, in order to ultimately ended up exchanging five uh, folks out of uh, detainees out of Guantanamo Bay for Sergeant Bergdahl to get him home. Uh, frankly, I would have emptied the entire place, of all entire Gitmo to get him home if that's what it took. Because in my mind, one American soldier is worth that. Oh, and, and let's just keep in mind also, to date, we still haven't charged anybody at Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and that's probably a different story for a different time. But the reality is... You know that nothing there was there was no cases pending as far as somebody about to be prosecuted for something. So they were just kind of sitting there languishing. In my mind, I also looked at it as that this is why we have Hellfire missiles in the U.S. inventory. If they return to the battlefield, we'll deal with that. We have other ways to solve that problem. We do. Yeah, we do. So and it, it it was a, a great uh, effort on and teamwork. Uh, at the interagency level between the State Department, uh, U.S. Uh, Southern Command, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, the folks in Afghanistan. It, it was just a phenomenal team effort where everybody came together. But it was a a strategic objective with operational staging 
with real tactical outcomes that fed every step of the way. So in my mind, it's exactly how military operations should go. Interesting. What about Ebola? I know, you know, you, at one point you got tasked with uh, when Ebola was outbreaking in, in Africa uh, with the U.S. response to that. Talk to me about that. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. You know, I was uh, tasked by uh, Secretary Hagel again because, um, you know, let's face it, no good deed goes unpunished. Yep. So so I, so I got another one is, is to help eradicate um, the, the Ebola epidemic uh, and outbreak in in uh, West Africa, in particular Liberia. And uh, this, it started off with a phone call from the CDC director. You know, this is where I really learned about how to uh, you know, kind of focus the mission and work at the interagency was that he called me and he says, hey, uh, yeah, I understand you're the guy at the at Department of Defense. What can you do to support us? And it's like, I don't know. I can send tanks. What do you want me to bomb? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what kind of, air, yeah, yeah. I can send an aircraft carrier. What, 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 what do you want? And he, and he goes, well, what can you do? And it's like, well, we don't really work that way. What, 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 what's the mission you want us to do? And it really helped educate the interagency um, as well as the department on doing real mission analysis and focusing, um, you know, the department on what it can do. We ended up landing at the place where we did those things that were uniquely military. Uh, we could do the logistics. We could fly all the support equipment in and out of the country. We could build the Ebola treatment units because we've got CBs, we've got Red Horse, we got people that can build. Yeah, for sure. It, yeah, and, and it was, uh, so we had, it was doing training. We know how to train on scale. So we were training healthcare workers because we had healthcare workers coming from all over the world that were migrating to help solve selflessly wow. uh, to, to, to solve this problem. And then ultimately, it was providing command and control. This is where the 101st Airborne, uh, after, uh, after a while, came in and, and basically ran the, the operation from bringing their military acumen in to effectively move the logistics, get the people where they need to do to ultimately uh, stem Ebola in Liberia. Interesting. So, okay, so when you're you're done there, yeah, you again retire from service. Yeah, again, um, you go into public. Well, you you go into private sector. I do, mm -hmm. um, and are doing some kind of policy stuff, and and when. Then you end up at a software company, right? You end up yes. doing some mm -hmm. computer stuff. Like, how how do you think everything from your prior life helped you when you got into the private sector? You know, it, it's interesting. Is that so? Yeah, I was the president of an uh, an IT company, and I will tell you what, I really on day one really couldn't spell IT. You know, I I, I couldn't. I, yeah. I I didn't know about you know. It, it wasn't it was IT modernization. So it's data migration, data data syndication. It was about getting disparate things, you know, sources of, of information kind of colluged together, ultimately, ultimately resulting in, you know, usable data that leaders could, could use to manage in the healthcare sector. You know, but the principles are about the same in leadership. They are. It's about getting a workforce, getting them committed and focused. It's about creating processes. It's about focusing on outcomes, whether it's just a happy customer or it's to do something with data to get some unique, something unique that you never had or saw before. Because the one thing I have learned over the years is you can't solve a problem you can't see. So you have to be able to see the problem. And data, 90% of the time, can help with that. So it was about taking all that great stuff that the taxpayers paid lots of money to teach me and kind of put it to work. Interesting. So in, you were recently tasked uh, to be on the Afghan War Commission. Yeah, so, uh, and I think it was the, uh, I can't remember what year, the National Defense Authorization Act created the Afghanistan War Commission. But essentially, it's to unpack 20 years of war and come up with the lessons learned. of What did we do well? What did we not do so well? Um, so they, there's 16 members of the commission nominated by different members on the Hill, um, House, Senate, different committees, I happen to be the Senate Armed Services Committee, Jack Reed's uh, uh, nominee for, for the commission. Uh, it's, it's 16 people who are just w wicked smart. 
Some of them have been on the ground. Some of them are, are policy folks. And we're coming together to do a kind of a holistic view of U.S. efforts in Afghanistan. One thing that's most impressive about this organization is it's not a whitewash. And nor is it a, you know, I gotcha kind of thing. It's about coming up with lessons and viewpoints of of how we can learn from what happened to help and aid decision making in the future. So I, I align it more along the 9-11 commission than anything else. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I think that, and I, obviously coming from where you come from, that's a culture that you've embraced most of your life of, you know, kind of hot washing things and really looking at them and how do we, how do we not do this? You know, the, the stuff that we did right, how do we continue to do that? And the stuff we screwed up, which I think in Afghanistan, there's probably going to be quite a few lessons learned. Um, how do we, how do we not do this again? Yeah. I, I think we need to go back and, and take a look at every step of the way, whether everything from the equipping of our force to how we made the decisions. Decisions that were made are interesting, but how did we make them? Yeah. Yeah, I think that that um, time has not been overwhelmingly kind to our effort in Afghanistan, not only in how long it lasted, but the the fallout from it. and you know, how we burned through special operations personnel and how we burned through, through our DOD personnel, um, I, I think is, is something we probably need to take a look. I, I agree. So I'm just uh, excited and proud to be, first of all, nominated for the effort to be also, but also to be a participant. Yeah, that's fantastic. You're a perfect guy for the job. Why don't we finish with kind of some rapid fire questions? Okay. Let them rip. Let's see. Um, what do you think your most important habit is? Every night when I shower, I think about my day of what I would have done differently and done better. Sometimes it's a 30 minute shower, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I'm pretty hypercritical of myself, but I kind of take my entire day and reevaluate it and, and just kind of grade myself. Uh, I think that it helps shape my, the next day. What was the most profound moment or memory of your career? I can remember when I was a junior officer. Uh, I was the assistant officer in charge of a SEAL platoon, and we had a training accident that had profound impact on two members of the team. And it was what affected me was seeing the team coming together to treat, treat life-threatening wounds and seeing training really pay off. Interesting. Which probably then, I mean, at that point, you're a junior officer, so everything you do from then on is inflected by that moment. And it, when it, at the end of the day, it was about the basics. Yeah. It always is. Yeah, it generally... That's the expression. In in the end, it's all about you know driving and putting, and everything else is kind of noise. Um, what do you think the most important characteristic of an effective leader is? Humility. Why? Because some I would say ineffective leaders put their ego too close to their position. They think they are that position. They are not. They just happen to be the incumbent, and they are the keeper of the standards. I can't touch that any better than you just said it. Um, what keeps you awake at night? I, I, I am concerned um, about... You know, I, it, it's hard to come up with the, just the one thing. Um, what's happening in the information environment right now uh, and the way how vulnerable the average American is making themselves and subsequently making our country, I have real concerns for what the future holds. What do you think we can do to assuage that? I, I, I don't have an answer. 
Uh, um, I, I think one of the best things that's ever happened to our society is the internet. I think one of the worst things that's ever happened to our society is the internet. It's, um, it, it, again, it's truly a double-edged sword. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, if I had an answer, you know, I, frankly, I wouldn't be up at night. Yeah, that's well said. Well said. Michael, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate your time. This has been fantastic. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, John.